and welcome to Entertainment Weekly's What to Watch, the show where EW staff help you solve your viewing dilemmas. I'm your host, Jared Hall, and I'm joined today by America's second favorite trio after Destiny's Child, editor-at-large Jane Hibbard, TV critic Kristen Baldwin, and digital news director Jillian Cederholm. Welcome, everyone. So nice to see all of you. Hi. This weekend sees the premiere of The Comey Rule, Showtime's two-part miniseries about James Comey's time as FBI director under Presidents Barack Obama and then the transition to Donald Trump. It's based on Comey's book, A Higher Loyalty, and it stars Jeff Daniels as the former FBI director and Brendan Gleeson as President Trump. Kristen, does this feel too soon or is it necessary to remind audiences of these events, especially before this upcoming election? I think that depends on who you ask. Uh, the, the writer director, Billy Ray, really felt like it had to be that this needed to air before uh, the election. In fact, when Showtime initially was going to premiere it in late November, he was quite upset and sent a note to his cast apologizing, but they moved it. Um, to me, it feels like reliving history as it's happening. Like we're still living through the Donald Trump of it all. And depending on your uh, your worldview, it can either feel like fake news or it can feel like punishment. Who do you think is going to watch this? People who were in the know, people who were out of the loop, but curious? Yeah, I have no idea who this is for because uh, certainly people who support the current administration probably aren't going to check it out. And people who don't, would probably rather hack off their own foot and eat it than have to sort of watch a dramatic reenactment of these events again, no matter how well it's executed. And it's very well acted and it's nicely shot and good cast, a lot of great character actors. You got Scoot McNary, love me some Scoot yeah. as Rod Rosenstein. Yeah. And uh, Joe Latruglio is in it at one yeah. point as Jeff Sessions. Yeah. <laughs> like there's yeah. some T good T cast. TR Knight, right? TR uh, Knight uh, shows Priebus, up as Ryan yeah. Priebus. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, I just, I don't know who it's for. Actually, that's not true. I think who it's for are Emmy voters for next year. I think Showtime mm. is just desperate for an Emmy. James, you spoke with uh, Jeff Daniels here. Did he offer any insight mm. into that kind of, that that quiet steal of James Comey? <laughs> yeah, he, he, he talked about uh, the challenge of portraying someone that, that very much isn't, um, you know, exactly saying what he's thinking. You know, he's, he has to keep it under wraps and keep it himself very reserved at all times and just try to give those subtle clues of, of frustration or, or feeling, you know, offended or, or, or feeling, you know, shocked. You know, it, it's, it's a little bit of a tricky performance because he's constantly opposite against people that he has to keep a poker face with, but he still has to let the audience in. Before we move on, uh, I, I want to talk about like, uh, creative liberties here. James, was there something that um, you didn't love about this adaptation? There was a couple times in it that they cut to a thing that was referenced in the infamous Steele uh, uh, dossier, right. and that is the uh, Russian hookers that uh, Donald Trump, you know, allegedly, allegedly right. <laughs> met up with uh, at a hotel in Moscow. And that was just the one thing I was like, you know, you know, that's one thing that's so contested and, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and, and unproven. And it kind of, kind of, it kind of undermined the rest of it, the, the surrounding material a little bit by going from, you know, meetings and events and things that we knew happened to something that we uh, didn't happen. But I also understand from a filmmaking point of view, if you have prostitutes and the president, a storyline, why they'd want to try and get something in there portraying that. Moving on here, there is a new season of Fargo, don't you know? Except this time around, it's set in Kansas City, Missouri. Chris Rock stars as the head of a black crime family whose members escaped the Jim Crow South, and Rock goes head to head with the Kansas City Mafia in the fourth season of this hit anthology series. James, this was originally slated uh, for an April release, but then production was delayed due to the pandemic. Now that it's finally coming out, it seems even more timely, actually, as America reckons with its racist history. Do you think these past few months had any impact on the series once they resumed in August? Well, the, the season only had roughly two more episodes to film and it's such an intricate story with so many moving parts that it's tough to imagine too much being changed other than what you might be forced to change in order to get the filming done under new restrictions. 
But yes, uh, racial inequality and police violence are issues in the fourth season. And, and I think that'll make the season resonate uh, a bit more strongly with viewers than if Fargo had come out in April as originally planned. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris Rock has said this is the best role he's ever gotten. Do we think this begins a new era of acting for him? I wouldn't think so. <laughs> I, 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 I had a tough time forgetting it's Chris Rock. I mean, uh, to me, it's okay if an actor isn't lost in a character, if that actor's own persona is somewhat close to what the character is. Like, for instance, to throw another rock in here, I don't need The Rock to be convincing as a character actor when his character sort of looks and acts like The Rock you know, like we expect them to, to. So there's no there's no dissonance there. But when you take somebody who's known for stand up and then you put them in a heavy dramatic role and add extra gray into his hair to make him look older, they really need to sell it so you don't have that uncanny valley feel. So does this new season feel like it's part of the previous three or is there anything new added here to this to this franchise? It definitely out? feels different in some significant ways. Uh, it's set in Kansas City, so you don't have that usual Minnesota small town feel. It's set in 1950, so you, you know it's set further in the past than any season previously was. And just thematically trying to make larger points about race relations and say something about America. It's swinging for the fences thematically more than uh, past seasons. All right. Thanks so much, James. Uh, you guys, we have to far go take a break real quickly. But when we return, we're talking Mask Singer and no, not the Phantom of the Opera. Warm up your vocal cords. We'll be right back. Welcome back to What to Watch. What does the Fox Network say? That surprise hit, The Masked Singer is back. The reality singing competition, which when you think about it was certainly ahead of its time, has returned this week and it's now followed by the brand new game show, I Can See Your Voice. Jillian, we've been vocal about uh, being all too familiar with this series. Does the tone feel different now though that we're in a, in a well, hopefully soon, post-pandemic world, but still filming in pandemic? So yes, I mean, Mask Singer has been ahead of its time from day one. They were all in masks, and it already felt like watching a, having a bizarre fever dream while you're watching it, so I only expect it to be even crazier, which is what makes it even greater. And we've, from what we've been told, it's already planning to be more bonkers than ever. So I'm really excited to see how the rest of this season goes. And I think that uh, all the changes they're making with the pandemic is just going to make it even more wild. How will they tackle production in this kind of socially distant way? Does it feel like a mezzo? Mm -hmm. So we are back in the studio. I'm just going to blow right past that. Uh, we are back in the studio. The panelists are spread out. They're socially distanced. The studio audience, there is going to be a smaller studio audience. They are spread out, but they're using ARR technology to fill it in. So we will wow. be getting some of those insane crowd shots of uh, people in the audience completely losing their mind over someone singing or somebody yeah. revealing themselves before the yeah. mask has actually been taken off yes. um, that we love to see. So and what, weren't the, um, weren't the judges already super far away anyway? Cause it was always like they were looking, with, but not <laughs> They're very far away yes. from the stage. Yeah. From the stage. Yeah. 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 So Nick Cannon's the only one who's going to be in really close proximity once the mask is off. So we'll have to see how that goes. Um, another big change that they're making is for the first time ever, some fans are going to be invited to help cast their vote for who gets eliminated. Um, mm -hmm. A small group of super fans is uh, going to be selected to take part in a virtual audience and they will be able to, to vote and you can uh, go visit the mass singers, social media accounts to figure out how to be part of that. Hmm. All right. That sounds like a fun little addition. Okay. So uh, we know that a lot of people were obviously not able to work uh, over the summer. So once the Masked Singer figured out how they could shoot, do you think that means they had a bigger pool of talent and celebrities who were like, hey, put me to work. I'll do this. I hope so. I mean, <laughs> Lil Wayne showing up last season really set the bar high for the caliber of established musicians and celebrities that this show can get. And so I think that we are just going to see even more. We do have um, a lot of clues about who we have. We have 
combined, they've sold more than 281 million records worldwide. We've got 10 Hall of Famers. Uh, people have appeared in five Super Bowls. We have an Olympic gold medalist. So even the clues that we have, um, we've already got some superstars, we hope, in the mix. So wait, the, the duo costume, is it going to be like two people stuck in one costume, like a like oversized clown pants or whatever? They're, they're together in kind of a giant egg, but then they both have their own two heads. So, so they will have knows? to like move together on the stage. Yeah, the movement looks really awkward. It doesn't look sure. like a costume where they're going to be able to do any dancing, which a lot of characters do incorporate. So um, we could be getting our first costume disaster if they yeah, fall yeah. over each other which yeah. just costume just makes it even more we'll fun see. yeah <laughs> that is it for our show but before i sing us out are you guys ready thank you to my guests james hibbard <laughs> Kristen baldwin and julian's here we'll see you next week on what to watch yeah.